Okay, so this is the third video in this lesson looking at the impact of the pandemic on inequalities uh, in the UK and in other countries as well. The key question is whether you think the pandemic will worsen economic and social inequality. And it may well be the case you want to press the pause button and have a think about that and perhaps jot down some thoughts. We know there are lots of existing inequalities in terms of income and wealth and jobs, education and health and other aspects. Do you think the pandemic will worsen economic and social inequality? If it, if it will, that's going to be a major policy issue for years to come. A recent report from the Institute of Fiscal Studies, the body that's setting up the uh, review by Angus Deaton, which we saw in the last video, finds that the effects of the pandemic will widen inequality. A lot of people are very, very worried about this indeed. There are several strands to the thinking. One is that young people in particular will suffer in the labour market as the economy goes into a deep downturn. Uh, young people are highly dependent typically for uh, seasonal work, temporary work in hospitality and retail sectors. And of course, those are the industries, retail, hospitality, bars, tourism, etc., hotels, which really have felt the brunt of the shutdown and the lockdown. Very, very big fears that young people, not only might they have their education uh, disrupted, uh, indeed, including school and college and university, but there just won't be as many jobs left for them to uh, pick up those important earnings. And of course, if young people suffer uh, in the short term, there could be a long term effect in terms of future earnings potential. Many low income families, we talked about this in the first video, um, thousands of them. Uh, work in key jobs in particular if they have sometimes two people in work. But many low-income families have little or no savings to fall back on uh, if they lose their job, have to rely on income support and other benefits, or if there's a big bill that comes their way, a hefty utility bill, for example, which they simply can't pay. And if you have low savings, you don't really have that buffer, that safety net to fall back on when, when work in work income dries up. And of course, we know that many people are working in those high risk occupations, including in care homes, uh, in hospitals, uh, in delivery and transports, uh, in retail, those, uh, those people tend to be high risk at work, higher risk, particularly if there are shortages of uh, protective equipment. And they're also among the lowest paid workers in the UK. Uh, many families, of course, are in rented property. And although the government's given uh, a mortgage holiday for people with a mortgage. There isn't quite the same protection for people in rented property. Many people have a, a chronic illness and therefore are susceptible to comorbidities. The risk of serious illness and perhaps death goes up uh, if coronavirus strikes alongside a second or third chronic illness. So those p p people in particular, of course, vulnerable to the pandemic, as indeed uh, the, the vulnerability of children of key workers. Uh, who uh, many key workers also have to go to work. Uh, some schools trying to uh, lighten the load by staying open and provide some crucial education for those workers. There's some quite important evidence which came out of the IFS study I wanted to share with you. Uh, the estimates for the UK suggest that a 1% fall in employment, a 1% fall in the number of people in work, can lead over time to a 2% increase in chronic illness. Now, employment is falling by more than 1%. Uh, let's say it falls 5%, worst case scenario, even 10%. You can do the maths that uh, it's likely that there could be a significant number of people into the millions of people of working age developing a chronic health condition than would otherwise have done so. So there are some significant economic as well as social uh, health issues uh, that really are worrying people. And the evidence seems to be uh, that if you take uh, an index of multiple deprivation, uh, that's based on indicators. If you look at the x-axis here, you go from least deprived parts of the UK across the right-hand side to most deprived areas. They use things like income, number of people in work, health, education, crime, access to housing, all those kind of factors. Uh, the evidence seems to be the COVID-19 virus has had a proportionately higher impact on the most economically and socially deprived areas of the UK. If you look at the dark 
blue line there compared with all death shown in grey you can see that COVID-19 has had a proportionally higher impact on age standardised mortality rates and that's clearly a major worry uh, for many people involved in social care and economists also have to have a, a feel about this. Some of the evidence that came out published by the Office for National Statistics I wanted to share with you. Uh, they looked at deaths involving COVID-19 and the rate of death for the least deprived areas, areas of relative prosperity, was 25.3 deaths per 100,000 people. Uh, the rate in the most deprived areas was 55 deaths per 100,000 population. So over 110% higher than in areas of relative prosperity. I also want to just share with you, uh, finally, two more slides. This slide is taken from a superb talk given by Eric Beinhocker from the Oxford Martin School. It's to do with the United States. Uh, on the y-axis here, on this right-hand side, you've got the wage. So people down here in red uh, are low, relatively low wage people. Uh, and as we go from right to left, to move from, from here to here, from going from right to left, those are jobs which people are less able to work at home. Uh, the blobs all represent occupations and the size of the blobs represents the, uh, the number of people who typically work in those occupations. And the evidence seems to be here uh, that lockdown in the States is disproportionately affecting uh, a lot of people in relatively low wage jobs uh, who literally cannot, cannot work from home. So they have to go out to work. They can't work at home and you know, they really do. They really do have to, to go out to work if they want to earn an income. And of course, with lockdown, strong, stringent regulations on who can go to work, uh, that means a fall in income. And in the same talk, uh, a really, really important aspect I think it's worth thinking about in terms of the crisis. Uh, what have we got on the y-axis this time? We've got on this axis the exposure to the infection. So the higher we go up the axis, the greater the exposure to potential infection. And again, we're going from a high wage here to low wage bottom left. The point that Eric is making in his talk, and I'll put a link to the talk in the comments section of the video, is that in the United States, many frontline workers are at higher exposure risk because of the nature of their jobs. They're working as cleaners in care homes, they're working as janitors in hospitals, they're working as childcare workers, or they're working as nurses. In, in hospitals and in care settings. So they are at high risk, but they also tend to be low income. Uh, and that's really quite important. Uh, Eric Beinhock has said that for many low income workers, uh, you risk health or no job. But for millions of higher income knowledge workers, I'm, I classify myself as one of those, fairly comfortable at home teaching, keep my job safe at home. It's a different proposition. As Emily Maitlis famously said in her Newsnight talk, this is a pandemic which is not, not a great equaliser, far from it. Uh, in the sixth session, so that's our fifth session, we're going to look a little bit uh, more positively at uh, the ways in which the pandemic might be accelerating innovation. Oftentimes out of a crisis, new ideas, new products, new processes come through. So we're going to look at the concept of creative destruction and ask the question, how might the pandemic actually improve our economy in the future. Okay, thank you very much indeed.